I have this stone here in my pocket. Do you have your stone in your pockets? Can you show me your stones? If you don't have a stone, you need to go back and take a stone from one over, the, over there at the entrance. You will need a stone. This stone, stone is my sin. And my sin is weighing me down so much. It's not a topic people, current people, love discussing. This is not a very popular topic if you would love to start online chat room. It's not a very something that people would acknowledge it. There are so many topics I would love to share with you on Easter, uh, on Easter time, like just talking about historical evidence for Christ's death. It would be absolutely excellent topic. I would love to talk to you about moral justification. Why is it possible that Christians find such a cruel death on cross inspiring and necessary? If you have questions with these two things, please take your connection card, put your name down, and say, I would like more information about this. Because it makes a wonderful sense if you are in, in touch with information. But many of us believe in a world that has been devoid from any positive influence of Christianity, and we fail to understand significance of the best event that has happened to you and me. Now, today, I don't want to deal with those two topics. It's too bright. I would like to talk about the reason why we have the Easter. And the reason we have the Easter celebration, the reason why Jesus has come to live on this earth, why he has uh, died, been buried, and resurrected, is so you, so he can deal with our stones. Do you have your stone? Many people deny it. Many people say, no, no, there is no stone. There is no burden in my life. There is no sin. But then they have to just listen to a story of Daniel Morcom and realize that there is sin in the world, whether they want to deny it or whether they want to accept it. Many people deal with this by saying, well, this is not as bad as, as you are trying to make it. It's not so horrible. But then again, we look at North Korea, and we look at drug overdose, we look at rapes, we look at violence, we look at starving children in Africa and we realize it is very serious. Sin is very serious. Some of us deal with this but saying, look, I am a good person essentially. I live an ethically good life. And I need to ask you then, by whose standards? If you have your own standards, are you even living up to your own standards all the time? And if somebody has, else has different standards, there will be a constant conflict as to whose standards are you supposed to live. Some of you are trying to deal with this topic by, by saying, I'm accepting myself as a sinful person. Yes, I'm sinful and I'm fine. I'm okay, you are okay. Have you heard this phrase? Yeah, of course you are okay. And I'll tell you why. But then again, why, if sin is okay, why is there outcry for justice in the world? Why is there outcry for equality in the world? Why do we want or prefer democracy over despotism? Why do we want anything good in our life? Why don't we just simply accept evolution has had its, its, its road, now we are at this stage, and we are happy to suffer for the rest of the life. Go to the hospital. Go to the ward with heavily injured people and tell them, you are injured, you will never be okay anymore, but that's okay. Your life is over, but be happy for everybody else whose life is not over. And then we realize sin is serious. It's heavy. It burdens us as humanity, as a person, as individuals. We need to deal with this. And how do we deal with this? How we deal with this will depend whether you will be a free or whether you will always carry 
this stone in your pocket, in your box. Jesus has dealt with this. And I would love to very briefly share this with you. I would love to invite you to a special experience today where you will experience what we call the great exchange. This is a phrase coined by, I believe, Martin Luther. And we will read text about this. I would like to start from Isaiah 53. I would just like to read a couple of verses, tell you a story, and invite you to exchange your stone, your sin, your heavy, heavy box for something so much better. Isaiah 53 Verse 1, we read this. Who has believed our report? Not many. The thing is, in the same, today's culture is the same as time of Jesus or as 500 years before Jesus when this text was written in Isaiah 53. Who has believed our report that something great is going to happen? Not many. Because we don't like to talk about sin. We would love rather to live our lives Leave it to the fool or leave it somehow crazy or denied. But we don't want to come to the point where we have to admit we have a problem. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? To you. To you the arm of the Lord is being revealed right now. The message of salvation and redemption is coming to you right now. It's touching your heart. Are you feeling it? Are you fighting it? For he shall grow up. And this is talking about Jesus. A prophecy written a long time before Jesus is a prophecy that says, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form of comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised now and then, and rejected by men now and then. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. If you are having grief, if you are having burden, he understands. He is there for you. He knows what you can do with this. And we hid our faces from him. He was despised. And we did not esteem him. If ever, today, Jesus is despised. Are you hiding your face from him? Are you rather listening to voices of common culture? A culture that has no gods, that has no guidance, that has one thing in, in, in big uh, planet. This is spend as much as you can, live as much as you can and die because there is nothing for you tomorrow. I hope Jesus is not despised today in your hearts. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. And here is the story now. He was wounded for our transgressions, for our sins. He was bruised. For our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. By his stripes we are healed. His name was Marco. It's a story I heard when I was in my native Croatia, where I was born and where my beautiful accent is from. Marco was a poor guy. His mother had a few more kids together with him, and she was a village woman. They lived in a village in a rural area where most of the Europe actually lived until recently, until last century. And the story is based on true events. Marco was a brilliant student. He was keen to learn and, and, and know, and he wanted to do something with his life. His father was dead. He, was, he only had mother to provide for him, and his mother worked very, very hard. She was, uh, she was um, sewing and making clothes and cleaning and doing everything possible she could to help the, her kids grow up into people they wanted to be. One day, there was a competition at the school, and they announced that there will be a test, and whoever gets this test 
who gets the best score on the test, this person will get a stipend to go and do the high school in the city. Now you have to understand, the high school wasn't always necessary in, in, in our civilizations. Uh, school, in fact, a matter of fact, wasn't necessary. Most people grew up in my parents' time, in where they come from, without basic education. So four years school was considered a huge thing. To go to high school was considered a huge prestige. To go to university, now you have to have a lots of money to do something like this. So he was offered, so whoever wins, who has the best score on this test, the government is going to send this guy to city. Uh, it will give him stipend for scholarship and for accommodation, for school, for uniform, for the books, everything. Marco was studying hard, and when the test came, he did his best, and he thought, I am the best, the brightest kid in this school. I will probably get this. And he was so hopeful. He was excited. I'm going to go to the city. I'm going to become somebody. I will not live in this village for the rest of my life. I have to be farmer and be poor for the rest of my life. I will become somebody. And when the, the, the results were revealed, it was not Marco who had the highest score, who got the stipend. It was another boy. A boy who was lazy, a boy who didn't pay much attention to school, a boy who didn't do very well on the test, but whose father was a major in the army. He was a person of the influence. The test was rigged. And Marco was crushed because this boy who doesn't deserve to go and get his stipend, he's getting it, and he who deserves it will stay in the village. He was crushed, and he went home and told his, his mom this, and he just didn't want to do it. He was so depressed. He went back to school and he just resumed, my life is over, basically. I had this one chance and I missed it because of corruption of the system. A few days later, his mother <clears throat> came to talk to him. <clears throat> and she said, look, I have a plan. It's not going to be easy, but I want to send you to school in the city. And he said, how? What are you talking about? You don't have any money. And she said, when the time comes, when you finish this, uh, this year, when the time is to go to the high school, I have saved a little bit, and I will, we will use this money to pay for the, for, the, for the school. I have talked to some people, and they have let me work more for them. And I have a, a person I know in the city where you can live, and then I will bring you food from our garden to the city so you can have food there. And Marco was kind of happy and kind of unhappy because he understood what a sacrifice his mother is going to have to have just to be able to afford this. But he had no other option. So when the time came, he went to school in the city. He was lodging, he was sleeping, he had, there was a spare bed in this uh, person's uh, house. He was cleaning the house, and he was doing all the jobs around it just to get this little, little dirty, uncomfortable bed to be able to sleep somewhere and to study until late at night. He was going to school, and this was paid, and every once a day, his mother would walk all the way from her village by the foot to the city, some distance from around 10 to 12 kilometers, and she would deliver food so he could eat. The life was getting pretty good. He got to know some people. He got to know people of influential people. Some kids were teacher's kids. Some kids were a politician's kids. Some kids were doctor's kids. Some kids were um, people, kids of people who had standing in the city. And he became friends with them, and he finally understood, I am becoming somebody. These people who are respectful people respect me. Finally, I've made it. I will be able to be influential. I will have a life. One day he was standing with his new acquired friends, talking, when somebody called out to him, Marco, Marco. And they all turned around, 
And across the road, there was a village woman. She had big boots on, and she had a huge coat. It was all sprayed with mud. She didn't have a beautiful hairdo like other women in the city had. She had this big scarf over it. She looked like a village woman. I don't know if you ever saw a village woman from Croatia, rural, but she was dirty. She was nothing to look at. And other kids looked at her and he said, Marco, is this your mother? Why is she calling you? And he looked there and he looked back and he said, no, that's not my mother. And he walked away. And later on, <clears throat> he realized, it dawned on him. This woman who was his mother is not so dirty and so, has no good clothes and has no good hairstyle because she wants to. But because she gave everything she had for his future. She would stay late at night and work, and she slept three hours a night, and she would spend last money so he could have a life in the city. And when it dawned on him that she is like this so he can have a life, the message finally struck, my mother is the most influential, most important person in my life. I can have a life because of her misery. And today, we don't have mothers who are village women, but we have Jesus Christ. And this text in Isaiah 53 says, For our sins, He has been suffering. So you have future. He has been, He has had a thorn on His head. And he was injured, and he was hit, and mocked, and put down. So you can have a life, a life to the full. He was put on the cross, and he was bled, bleeding, so you and I, today can have a wonderful future. There is a text that I would love to finish with in Second Corinthians Chapter 5, verse 29. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. For God made Jesus sin who knew no sin, so that you and I who have our sin always with us can become righteous in the sight of a holy God. What will you do with your sin, with your stone, with your box this Easter? I would like you to ask you, to invite you for, to a great exchange. Exchange your sin for the grace of God. Before us we have bread symbolizing Jesus' bruised body. We have wine symbolizing Jesus' spilt blood. In this he has poured all the sin and died for all of sin that ever happened and ever will happen for sins that you and I have done. So today we can accept it. We can't do anything to buy it. We can't do anything to earn it. All your righteous works are just required as they are. They will never cover for sins you have done. God has called you to this grace that is not deserved. God has humbled himself so you can have a life today. I would like to invite Kara as we come and as we pray over bread and wine. And then we will invite you to come today. In a symbolical way, exchange your sins by this stone 
by coming this way and placing it at the foot of the cross. Then we will invite you to exit either way, wherever you sit, and to come and take bread and wine. Symbols of God's grace. Symbols of how your sins have been pardoned and redeemed for. And go and sit back at your place. And then we will together partake of Jesus' body, symbolical body and symbolical blood. Before we do this, I would just like to read a text from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. To see how Jesus has done this communion when he lived. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink, as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes and come he will. Carl will say a prayer over the bread and I will say prayer over the wine and then we will invite you to do the great exchange. If you bow your heads, let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, before we take this bread, we just want to pause and thank you. Thank you for what you gave, for laying down your life, for coming here to begin with, Lord, and taking on this pain that we experience every day. Lord, we just want to thank you for that. Thank you for the body that you gave. In Jesus' name, amen. Dear Jesus, in your blood there is a new covenant. A new covenant that says that you are our God and we, and we are pardoned. We don't have to carry this box of sins anymore. We don't have to feel guilty for our sins because you have pardoned them. In this blood we find the power. We find your story of resurrection as well. And you have invited us today that as unworthy as we are, as sinful as we are, as undeserving as we are, that we would come to your table of grace and receive it freely without fear of God because you are so loving that you have humbled yourself for us. This morning I would love to thank you for your blood spilled and ask you that you forgive my sin and ask everybody here to do this silent prayer as well for forgiveness of their sins. Amen. Oh,